And sometimes that delay there is me uh, wading through the Jordan River of kids on their way to class, which is a really cool thing to, uh, that's not really a problem, but if it were a problem, it would be a really cool problem to have. Today, we are going to be in Hebrews chapter, uh, well, mostly in chapter 4, but of course we heard today uh, Hebrews 3.12 all the way through 4.13, and do not worry, I'm not going to try to preach every verse of that. But if you want to go ahead and open your Bible there, or queue up your device, if you basically, if, you're, if you have a Bible, you keep chapter 4 open, you'll be good, okay? Now, in the NIV, New International Version, that's the version that we, we heard uh, scriptures read in today, the idea of rest or resting comes up 11 times in these verses. So that's the message God wanted the um, church back then and the church today to hear from this passage. So today we're going to be talking about rest. Hebrews was written to a group of Christians in the first century. We've talked about this a bit. Their church was kind of under siege. They were being bullied by their culture. They'd been rejected by their neighbors. Probably some of their families had disowned them. So life was really hard for them. And a lot of them were struggling personally. You, what happens when you, when you struggle for a long time? They were growing weary and restless. Hebrews was written for restless Christians. You ever feel restless? Some of them had grown so weary, so restless. They said, you know, I, I, don't, I don't have the, the energy. I don't have the time. I don't have the emotional space for all of this drama in my life. And so I'm out of here. So they left. They stopped coming to church. They stopped talking about Jesus. They ghosted all of their Christian friends. And that just left this little church feeling even more weary and restless. So Hebrews saw these weary, restless Christians in this struggling little church. Hebrews wanted to encourage them. So what Hebrews told them essentially is, look, I know that you're weary I know that you're restless. I know just what you need. You need rest. You need rest. So Hebrews reminded them and, uh, that God had offered them rest. Hebrews 4 verse 9 that we heard today says, There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. We'll talk about this Sabbath rest more later on, but here's the basic idea. Because I don't know about you, but just hearing that passage read aloud, even someone was reading it, it's kind of confusing. What Hebrews was doing in this section was looking back on the days of Moses and Joshua, leading the Israelites, you know, through the wilderness into the land of Canaan, the land that God had promised them. Now remember, they had been slaves in Egypt, and God rescued them from slavery. And he was bringing them into, like I said, this land he had promised. Why? So that this nation of slaves could finally know rest. But while they were crossing the wilderness, and here's the part of the story that Hebrews was focusing on. While they were crossing the wilderness, the Israelites got weary and they got restless, and they lost their faith in the God who had saved them. So here's the warning in this passage it's from that story. God swore in his anger, they will never enter my rest. That's what God said about the Israelites who stopped trusting him in the wilderness. That was God's punishment. It was a fitting punishment. They wanted rest. They needed rest. But God made them wander restless in the wilderness for 40 years until they grew old and weary and they died never finding any rest. Rest. 
So like I said, if, if Hebrews 3 and 4 confused you today, that's what was going on. Hebrews was taking that story and using it as a warning for that, that weary, restless little church. Hebrews was telling them, basically, we Christians, we're like the Israelites back then. We were slaves to sin and to shame and the fear of death, but God rescued us from all of that. Now he's leading us home to rest with him in his eternal city, the new Jerusalem and the new heavens and new earth. This life now, this is what Hebrews wants them to understand. This life now is just the wilderness between slavery and the eternity of rest. But if you break faith with God now, like those wicked, unbelieving Israelites, you will never find any rest. Not now. Not in the world to come. You will perish in the wilderness just like they did. That's the warning that you heard today. We heard today right at the beginning of the reading. Hebrews 3 verse 12. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. Hebrews says, saying, I know you're tired and you're discouraged and you're restless, but don't you dare turn your back on Jesus. Don't you dare turn your back on each other. And don't you dare turn your back on the rest that God has promised you. Because oh, that would be so ungrateful, right? I know you're weary and you're restless and you need to rest, but you are not going to find the rest that you are looking for back there in the world. You're only going to find true rest in Jesus. God spoke through Hebrews to offer rest to that weary, restless church back then. And God is still inviting weary, restless people now to find their rest in Jesus. There remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. You know, honestly, I can't imagine if the gospel is good news, right? I cannot imagine, honestly, any better news for our culture right now that we are living in than a Sabbath rest. Our culture is the busiest, most stressed out, most workaholic culture we have ever seen. Do you know what the average work week, hour-wise, is for an Amazon employee? 80 hours a week. Oh, think about this. Here in America, we have a stereotype of, like, Japanese workers, right? How many of us think the Japanese are the most overworked, workaholic people, right? That's kind of a stereotype that a lot of us have been raised with. Do you realize that the average American worker will work 137 more hours this year than their Japanese counterparts? That's, you know, that's, that's nearly a week more of work out of the year. We have less holidays, fewer holidays. We take less vacations than other developed nations. And what's it doing to us? I'll tell you what it's not doing to us as a nation. It's not making us more productive. We are being told, give 110%. You can't do that. That's, that's stupid, right? There's no such thing. Or how about this one? Do more with less. You know what's happening is we're doing less with more. You know what the most productive nation, the nation with the most productive workers is in the world is this little country you may have never heard of, Luxembourg. And you know what their work week is? 29 hours a week. We are ranked fifth in productivity. And yet, we are driving ourselves crazy. You know, think about that. And that, against that backdrop, Romans 12, verse 1, famous passage, right? Do not be conformed to the patterns of this world, right? You know that. 
I honestly can't think of anything American Christians could be doing that would be less conforming to the pattern of our culture than to be a restful people in a restless culture. You know, in the Old Testament, God's people observed the Sabbath. They had a time of rest. They had a radical downtime inscribed into their law. It was a time when they, they were not supposed to be on. They didn't have to perform. They didn't have to feel pressure to be productive the way that the world counts productivity. They didn't have to answer to time clocks or bosses or emails. Now, think about this. Sabbath is one of the Ten Commandments, right? Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Now, I'm not saying at all, so don't hear me saying this, that our national laws should necessarily be based on biblical law, but I want you to just do this kind of thought experiment with me. Think about it this way. What else is in the Ten Commandments besides the Sabbath? Right? That's where we learn what do not kill, do not steal, do not commit adultery. Now, think about it like this. How healthy... Do you think a society would be where they encouraged murder and adultery and theft? Like, would you want to live there? Would you want to be a part of that culture? Would you be seeking to emulate that culture and go along with it? But how many of us even stop to question our society when it encourages us to overwork? But intentional rest, this radical downtime, is in the same list of commandments as don't steal, don't murder, don't commit adultery. We are living in a time that encourages us to ignore rest. And even when we are supposedly resting, you know, it usually, I mean, I do this too, right? It's in front of a screen. Somehow, somehow we do not put rest up there where it belongs as one of those kind of foundational principles um, written into the moral universe. So a lot of us just sort of tend to go with the flow of the culture on it. And let me tell you what it's doing. It is absolutely brutalizing and dehumanizing us as a people. Which, which makes sense. If you're, if you're treated like a machine, if you are the product, it's, it's crushing our bodies, it's our souls, our spirits, it's killing our relationships. It's even bad for our faith life. It's bad for our church life. How many people, I am too busy to go to church. I am just too busy. Do you know what it's doing to our children? I'm going to throw something at you. There has been an, just a spike like in the last decade among teenagers and young adults in clinical, like, anxiety disorders, depression, diagnosis, substance abuse, suicide. I don't think those two things are unrelated. See, our kids are, like, dealing with the same cutthroat, competitive culture that we are. But they are not emotionally, mentally, spiritually prepared for that. And really and truly, we shouldn't be playing around in it either. Do you realize right now there's been a study done? There, right now, the, the average amount of stress that our young people are reporting in their lives is like five to eight times higher than young people did during the Great Depression. That is a problem. A lot of us wear busy like a badge of honor. Like, and I do this too. Like, how often does somebody come to you and say, man, how are you doing? And you answer, oh, I'm so busy. We complain about being busy, but, you know, we're kind of bragging about it too. In our culture, when we say we are busy, 
what we are really saying is, I am productive, I am fulfilled, I have value, and I add value. And isn't that just tragic? It used to be we worked nine to five, we came home, and we left our work at work until the next day. I know that's word cleaver, right? Now, I understand, man, if you're like a farmer or something, that's different. Okay, I get it. Like, everybody's bag's different. But here's what I'm looking at, okay? Now we have this technology, right? We've got emails, we've got text messaging, and that means that more and more our work is encroaching, is spilling over into our family time, into our leisure time, because we live in this fast-paced 24-hour environment, and many of us are not free, or at least we don't feel free, when that email pops through, or that text message from the boss comes, asking why didn't you answer that email at midnight, we do not feel free to say no to that. We do not feel free to ignore it, to let it sit there until tomorrow, because we know we live in a cutthroat, competitive world, and somebody's going to be willing to put up with that, and then we're not gonna be able to pay our mortgage. Or, maybe, there's something else. Maybe there is a deeper weariness and restlessness that's behind our fear of looking lazy so that we must be busy at all costs. You know, one of my favorite Christian authors, Fred Beekner, says that often we stay busy because deep down we know something is wrong with us, but not wrong enough to do anything about. It's a way, and I'm saying that staying busy is a way of not dealing with difficult or painful stuff in our inner lives, in our relationships, in our family lives, or in our life with God. We keep our calendars, our planners, and our schedules maxed out. We keep going and doing and going and doing. Why? Because busy people don't have time to be introspective. Something we heard in our readings today speaks to this. Hebrews 4, 12 through 13 says, The Word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. And that's, that's kind of spooky, but here's the really scary part. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Maybe our restlessness, our busyness, is because we are afraid of being too quiet, afraid of being too still. Because in our quietness, in our unplugging from all the hectic stuff and the activity. Maybe that's when that still, small voice of God, that convicting word of the Holy Spirit, might confront us with some truth, some issue, some soul work we need to do because there's some pain that we're not dealing with. So we stay busy. We keep going and doing, trying to outrun, trying to duck and cover so that convicting word will not pierce our souls, trying to hide from God like children pretending that we don't hear our parents calling us. Often, and I'm talking about our culture, let's talk about our church. Let's talk about church in general, but, you know, Often that same restlessness in our culture finds a home because it's, it finds a home in our heart and we bring it to church. It finds a home in our churches. And that's when we need to remember that Hebrews was written for restless Christians like us. Busyness. Sometimes it's a status symbol. We stay busy so we can convince our neighbors, ourselves, even God himself, that we are productive and worthwhile and that we have value and then we add value. But sometimes, other times, a lot of times, 
It's a distraction from what can be the hard work, sometimes painful work, of learning. And learning often involves unlearning. Learning and stretching and growing, dealing with issues in the church family, doing soul work. We pursue busyness telling us that we are going to do big things for the Lord. I have a couple of thoughts about that. You know, you know I hate romantic comedies. And here, no, here's why. Because it's always about this, this beautiful young woman, and she is always, like, you know, this total, like, you know, jack wagon of a dude, this total nozzle, Right? is dating her and, and taking her for granted and doing all kinds of, you know, just... But then, like, okay, say anything. The famous movie of the 80s, you know, you show up at her window with a boombox playing Peter Gabriel and suddenly all is forgiven because it's the big thing. It's the grand gesture. I think a lot of us are focused on doing grand gestures for the Lord. Like, we're going to go out and be the dude with the, with the boombox blasting Peter Gabriel for the Lord. And it just makes me think about in the Sermon on the Mount, right? Jesus said, there are going to be people who show up in front of me on Judgment Day and said, Lord, Lord, we did so many great things in your name. And Jesus is going to say, I, I never knew you. And here's what he's saying by that. You might have been doing a lot of big things. You weren't doing them for me. I didn't, I didn't tell you to do those things. See, what's often lurking behind our restless busyness as Christians and as churches is a lack of faith. Right? Like the Israelites in the wilderness. And because we lack faith, we lack trust in our relationship with God, what God has done for us in Christ, and we get it in our minds somehow that we have to do the heavy lifting. We don't wait on the Lord. We don't patiently take our time to grow in the Lord or to grow in our joy and delight in one another. We don't take the time for sanctification and let the Spirit do His work of convicting us and restoring our souls and renewing our minds on the Spirit's timeline. And what happened... What happened to those weary, restless, faithless Israelites we heard about in Hebrews? They perished in the wilderness. They died. And they never entered God's rest. Hebrews was written for restless Christians. Their restlessness was killing their relationship with Jesus. It was killing their faith. And ultimately, it was going to damage the church. But through Hebrews, God is still calling to restless Christians to come rest in Jesus. Through Hebrews, God is saying to them and now to us, let me make you a restful people in a restless culture. Here's what Hebrews does for us in this passage today. Hebrews says... This is a, a, a really big, crucial thing to understand. There's two kinds of rest. They're both gifts from God. They're gifts from God. You do not earn them, but you're only going to find them in Jesus. Here's the first kind of rest that Hebrews talks about. It's the, it's the rest of fulfillment. That's the Sabbath rest. It's the rest of contentment, satisfaction. Deuteronomy 5.15 is one version of the, the law and the Ten Commandments about the Sabbath. And this is very illuminating, what this says. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt and that the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. So did they bring themselves out? No. Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. And one of the, one of the things that I think we, we miss sometimes when we're looking at these old stories, the Exodus, the Exodus is a model for our own salvation. We do not save ourselves. 
right? Um, baptism is something that God does to us in the water, just as he made Israel a people in their journey through the water, and he saved them. He's, that's, he's doing that to us. And just as God rescued the Israelites from slavery to an oppressor, through what Jesus has done, God also rescued us from slavery to sin and to shame and ultimately to death. And what, what God says to the Israelites, and all, he says to us too, right? because that story is a foreshadowing of our own salvation, what he says is, you are not slaves. You are not machines. You don't have to earn anything from me. I give you rest. But listen also to Hebrews 4, um, verses uh, 3, right about the end of the verse through verse 4. Somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day or Sabbath in these words. On the seventh day, God rested from all his works. Um, so what, the Sabbath commandment, one of the logic, you know, part of it is that I, I'm slaves and I've set you free to rest. But part of the logic is also woven into creation that God on the seventh day rested. Now this tells us something really cool about what Sabbath rest means. Yes, it is a rest from our labor. But it's, it's, it's rest from having to be on all the time. So we can look busy so we can convince people that we matter. <laughs> But Hebrews also connects Sabbath rest to God resting from the work of creation. Now, that's interesting because God is not like us in the sense that he does not get tired from his work, right? Like he doesn't need physical or even emotional rest like we do. If you go back to Genesis 1 and 2, in chapters that talk about the creation of our universe, when God sits down and rests... What he does, he's saying that he's looking over, he's looking out over the work of his hands and he's satisfied. He's content with what he has made. He says what? This is very good. He says it is finished. It is very good. Our Sabbath rest is rooted in that same idea is what, what did Jesus say on the cross? It is finished. Our Sabbath rest is rooted in Christ's finished work. We can rest because he is finished. His perfect life and his saving death have made us right with God. And that is what that means, right? Romans 8, 1, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It doesn't say that there's no discipline or chastising, sometimes, but there is no condemnation, right? And what that means is that even if, even if that double-edged sword of God's penetrating word has to convict us of, of sin or things that we're not dealing with, like we heard a few minutes ago, that does not condemn us if we are in Christ. And his resurrection is our promise of resurrection, our lives. And that's, here's what that means. This is why we can rest, because that means that our lives and the good work that we do will not be destroyed by death. Right? We're going to enjoy that, that eternal life in the world to come. So this frees us, right? If we know, man, my relationship with God is solid. If my life is preserved eternally in him. If I don't have to worry about missing out on anything because I'll have an eternity to enjoy it. What does that mean? That means that we can be free to be satisfied. We can take that radical downtime to enjoy God, to enjoy each other, and to rest. The second kind of rest that Hebrews is talking about is the rest of homecoming. That's the rest of the promised land. Right? We heard uh, that in the negative in verses 3 and 5 where God swears in his wrath, they will never enter my rest. Right? Talking about that faithless generation who fell in the wilderness. Let me ask you something about this rest of homecoming. Have you ever been 
Have you had a rough day, you know, one of those days where everything just kind of went wrong or you were just, you were so busy? Or you've been on a long trip and that feeling when you walk through the door of your house where like weight just drops off of you, right? Everything just feels right. I mean, you could almost, and it even matter, the living room might be messy, man, but you are so relieved to be home, you could kick up your feet and go, it is very good. <laughs> looking around your living room. Y'all know that feeling, right? That sense of being right where you belong, that's the kind of rest we find in Jesus. When you have saving faith in Jesus, and I'm gonna, this is the way I like to put it, and maybe you've never heard it quite like this before. When you, when you come to have saving faith in Jesus, you realize that you were born homesick. You were born homesick. And, and your whole life, you've been restlessly trying to find your way home. You've really just been wandering through the wilderness and looking for home in the wrong places. But then you come to Jesus and that weariness and that restlessness begin to dissipate. I love what Augustine said in his confessions, or as we say down south, St. Augustine. I, I love this. This is right at the beginning of his, of his confessions. He said, you have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it rests in you. And the promise kind of rounds out, it's a beautiful promise. Our, our reading from Hebrews today tells us that God will, in the end, Join these two kinds of rests together, the Sabbath rest of satisfaction and the promised land rest of homecoming. And he will join that together for us in eternity. That's Hebrews 4, verse 9 again. There remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. Through Jesus, God is bringing us home to him to enjoy him forever. But even as we travel through the wilderness of this life, we can rest in Jesus. We can rest in his finished work. He is our good shepherd who leads us to green pastures and makes us lie down beside the restful water. You ever take that uh, Psalm 23 and realize that's about Jesus? He will be with us even in the valley of the shadow of death. And it's okay. He will protect us through it. Because guess what? He already went through that, right? And he will safely bring us home to our Sabbath rest in the house of the Lord forever. God's rest is not something that we can earn by restless busyness. We don't have to convince Him that we are valuable. It is simply His gift to His people. You know, when Jesus called us, what did He say? It was Matthew eleven twenty eight? 28. Come to me, all you who labor or are weary and are burdened, and I'll put you to work. That is not what he said, is it? Because that wouldn't be good news. And he says what? Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, all you restless people, and I will give you rest. Now, I understand, I understand that there are busy seasons and restful seasons in life, and yes, even in the lives of churches. That's good. That means there's a rhythm, right? But even then, Jesus always calls us to rest in him. And sometimes we, it's both individually and collectively as a church, we need to carve out intentional time, even seasons of radical downtime. A time to focus on being and becoming, not just going and doing. A time for letting God restore us and refresh us and renew us. A time when we are listening to God we're delighting in God and that we're enjoying one another.
See, if we, if we take that intentional radical downtime, that's what keeps us from growing weary. That protects us from burnout. And that's how God protects us from the restlessness underneath our weariness. That restlessness that feels so urgent but makes us forgetful of Christ's finished work, right? There is a way that seemeth right to a man, but in its end is destruction. Sometimes we feel so urgently that this has to get done, has to get done now, and we don't even bother to inquire of the Lord if that's what He wants us to be doing. That busyness will kill you. So that's how this radical rest, radical downtime through Jesus God makes us a restful people in a restless culture. Now, as I said, you don't do that to yourselves. God is making us or wants to make us a restful people for a restless world because then they're going to want to come. That's what's going to help draw them to Christ because no, no, nobody's got time in this hectic, cutthroat world to just come to church and be given busy work. So let us rest in Christ. Christ, who daily bears the weight of the world. You know what that means? We don't have to. We don't have to be constantly going and doing. Christ is sovereign over creation, over the universe, over history. He's bringing it about to his end. Let us rest in Christ who has also borne the weight of our sin and shame on his cross. And that means that we don't have to be busy trying to convince God that we're worthwhile. We don't have to be restless about how we stand with him. We stand in the shadow of the cross. We stand covered by the life of his son. Let us rest in Christ who bears with us in prayer and intercession before the Father. That means that we never have to wonder if God sees or hears the God with a human heart is in heaven and he knows and he understands. Let us rest in Christ who is bearing us home to God's eternal Sabbath rest.